Alguns de vostès es preguntaran, i jo penso que la resposta a la pregunta és molt important, quina és la part especial que ens ha fet pensar que el professor Grohl era la persona idònia per inaugurar o per parlar d'aquestes jornades. Jo recordo, quan vaig començar la meva estada en l'àmbit de la qualitat, hauré de confessar que era a finals dels 70, just sortia de la guarderia, o sigui, no pensin vostès que això ho vaig estudiar jo de gran, no? Va ser els tres anys. Doncs quan vaig començar a finals dels 70 a treballar en l'àmbit de la qualitat, va haver-hi un moment a la meva vida que un dia vaig trobar un llibre del professor Grohl i em vaig quedar absolutament en una dada, perquè era una persona que havia sigut capaç de sistematitzar les diferents estratègies de canvi que existeixen de cara als professionals. Va ser per mi una llum de dir com pot ser que algú ho hagi pensat tan clar. Però el professor Grohl ha fet moltíssimes aportacions en el món de la ciència. Una de les més importants de totes és la importància de l'evidència amb la pràctica. El professor Grohl va dirigir el grup de la GRI, el grup que va posar les normes per seleccionar les guies de pràctica clínica que són bones de les que són la diferència entre un grup d'amics. I aquest és un dels motius pels quals està aquí. Correm el risc, quan comencem el tema de l'atenció integrada, d'oblidar-nos de la importància de l'evidència, de la importància de treballar amb allò que funciona. Jo he de dir que jo soc metge i he après moltíssimes coses dels serveis socials, les aprenc cada dia sobre l'atenció de les persones, com les persones de forma integrada poden treballar. Però en l'àmbit dels serveis socials hem d'introduir entre tots la importància de l'evidència. No es poden fer proves sense llegir-se la literatura si uns altres les han fetes i sapigueu els resultats. No es pot desenvolupar processos sense saber si altres ho han fet i sapiga què ha passat. Per tant, la presentació del doctor Grohl sobre la integració assistencial i l'evidència de la integració assistencial i com es jutja, voldríem que fos en aquest plantejament que ara comencem sobre una nova manera d'atendre les persones, un dels punts capdals per desenvolupar-la. Thank you, Richard, for being here with us. It's a real honor to have you here today. And I very much hope that your presentation will enlighten you in our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosa. Bon dia, queridos colegas. It's a great honor for me. It was a great honor for me yesterday to receive the Don Abedian International Award. A beautiful, beautiful event in the Palau de la Musica. And it's a great honor to be with you here today. And I think uh, probably that's the reason why you are here. I hope you understand my English. Is that okay? I like that. Um, the reason why you are here is probably because you're, just like me, change agents in your own setting. And you would like to see the best care for patients. And that's what I would like to see. So I worked all my life for that, and you are probably working for that. And we are all, and I will speak about change today. And uh, I hope that the things I'm telling you that uh, resonate in your own experiences. So I will speak about change. I will argue that in the end, professionals need to take the lead in the change process. Politicians can facilitate it, but professionals need to take the lead in that uh, process. And I will also argue that collaboration and communication between professionals and disciplines is absolutely crucial. So that is some of my main points in, in my uh, lecture. So when, when, let me see, where is this, how is this working? Yeah. When, when I started my career at the end of the 1970s, this man was actually the only mentor, the only mentor we had at that time. Donabedian, and particularly his scientific approach, I think was enormously important for us. So we read that, and that now I take you, and you all know this, um, this information, structure, process, outcome, but he has written beautifully about all these uh, uh, different aspects of quality at that time. 
And this was me in 1980. You see, I'm almost 70 now, so big changes, 35 years. You see me there full of hope. And um, I can't say that I'm disappointed, but I can assure you that uh, I was full of hope of improving quality for patient, uh, for patient care. And uh, I can tell you it's much more complex. Maybe I had the idea that I knew more at that time than I knew now. But anyway, it's, uh, I, I, I come back and what I particularly would like to do is share my experience around these uh, 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 events and change. I uh, want to share that with you. Okay. You are change agents. I am. And this is when I summarize the literature. This is our problem. And our problem is multifaceted. And I just made a summary slide with many different issues, and you will recognize it. And when I, from my studies, from many other studies, we always see the same type of things. We see that around 30%, 40% of the patients do not get the recommended care, sometimes evidence-based care, sometimes uh, very good project evaluations. 20-25% of all the tests we order or the medications we prescribe are not necessary and sometimes even harmful. You can see that um, many patients are harmed because of adverse events. For instance, in the Netherlands, they have calculated that 40,000 patients, we have 16 million people, 40,000 people per year uh, come into the hospital because of medication errors. We also know that's the same uh, case in the Netherlands, that best practices in man managing chronic patients, elderly patients, frail patients, are not used in practice. And particularly we see very large differences between localities, between practices, between cities. And we know that implementation of change in patient care is usually slow and often not sustained. Then I come to the primary care doctor and the family doctor and the primary care system. Uh, what you see here are photos of a famous uh, photog photographer, an American, and he was photographing at the end of the 40s a normal country doctor. A country doctor that's doing almost everything that you need to do, from seeing old people from, uh, to very young people. And this Actually, this cornerstone of the health system, I think it's still, in many places, it's still there. It's still there in, in the Netherlands, although it has been modernized. But this person that takes care of a whole family, a whole life, that's still quite important. And we also know, I have to see if I have it. Uh, this, this is probably working like that. We also have very good evidence that a strong primary care-oriented system with small practices, a GP as a first point of entry, maybe patients on their list, a gatekeeping role, etc., uh, is leading to better health outcome, lower health care cost, less use of health care, and more satisfaction in patients. This is, but this is research that has been done over this system over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And very important. Nevertheless, the world has changed and in many, many respects. And I already heard your chairman speaking about it. I think the enormous increase of frail elderly and people with chronic disease, enormous number of people who account and will account for most spending and workload in the future. Almost 50% of chronic patients at this moment already have more than one chronic condition. And these people see many different care providers. What you also see is that, um, at least in the Netherlands, but I guess this must be the same in Catalonia and the rest of Spain, that the roles of physicians and, agent and patients change. Patients are better informed, and younger generation is coming and is even better informed. So patients need to become active partners in chronic care management. We also have, in the Netherlands, we have an economic crisis, and I know you have an economic crisis. We have limited bu budgets, less budget than before, and we need to provide the same quality of care. How, do, how are you going to do this? So this demands new models of primary care, family medicine, integrated services, 
with better coordination, better collaboration. And I know that you are working on that here in uh, Catalonia and, and the rest of Spain. Very good models already. Maybe you, in some places you are farther ahead than the Netherlands. I don't know. But anyway, it's good that we discuss that. About the costs. This was a, an article in uh, Business Week, uh, I think, some years ago, and I think it's still the case. And they made this point for the United States, and maybe, I think you have to, may, maybe you have the same problems. Uh, anyway, in the United States, they said uh, around one third of the healthcare budget is wasted. Seven hundred billion dollars of unnecessary healthcare costs. And if we then think about the care we need to provide, it would be so helpful if we could reduce the unnecessary cost. And the keystone of this article was that we can do this by less fragmented and more integrated chronic care. And we can do it by coordination of care, by larger multidisciplinary collaboration. That was the key message. So I would like to discuss a little bit more about cost and quality. It's my conviction, and you see this in the literature, and also the other award winner of yesterday, John Overfight, has written a very good report on that. You can, uh, by maximizing the quality, you can also reduce the cost, and also in primary care. And you can do this in different ways. You can do this by using evidence, no unnecessary tests and treatments, you can do, uh, do this by reducing the number of errors and adverse events, uh, prevent, for instance, medication error, prevent, help in preventing readmissions to the hospital. I come back to that later. You can do this by coordination and integration of care, by substitution of care, timely care, and you can do this by care that is linked to the real needs and preferences of patients and involve patients as partners. So all these have, there are is evidence for that maximizing this type of care can help reduce costs. So I would like to talk today about this type of change. How can we implement this type of care, optimal or excellent care for our patients, and reducing uh, the, the costs? Okay, how to do that? And uh, yeah, I'm, in order to speak about this and not all the time going to serious business, I just want to like to make a step out of that and go into one of my hobbies, that's opera, and uh, something completely different. How many of you have ever seen the opera Leonardo di Figaro? Maybe in the Liceo or... Uh, uh, not many, but I tell you the story because it's a, not only musically a very beautiful opera, but it also has a very good story about change. And if you look at opera, most of the time they have very beautiful stories about change. But this is one very nice example. I tell you the story. This was uh, an opera at the end of the uh, 1700s, so around 1800. A revolutionary opera, just composed before the, before the French Revolution. But it was composed in, uh, in the Habsburg monarchy. They were a little bit more open than the French monarchy. And they opened the door for influence of the normal citizens a little bit. And the opera is linked to that uh, situation. It was based on a, uh, on a French uh, theater play. And the story is, a count has officially announced the end of the droit du seigneur, and that's the right of the landlord to sleep with the bride of his servants in the night before the marriage. So, you probably don't have it anymore in Spain. But, uh, Anyway, the opera is about this change, because he has announced it, but only on the pressure of the emancipation in general. And in fact, he behaves in a resistant way. All the time, he tries to deviate from his own guideline. So two and a half hours in the opera, he tried to seduce Susanna, the bride of his servant. So and this continues, and in the end, he finally says, OK, I will change and I will accept this guideline, I work according to this guideline. And the in interesting thing is, why was this so? Why was this change happening? So, I give you just a list of facilitators for change, because just like in medicine and in healthcare, there are usually a lot of 
facilitators and barriers for change. And for instance, here, reasons for change were transparency. There was data and feedback on its behavior, so everybody could see it was transparency. They could see his behavior, so he felt uh, a sense of urgency to change. Also, public exposure. He was his. He was uh, risking a. Uh, a loss of his reputation, so he needed to change. There was social pressure because his wife and his servants didn't accept his behavior anymore. There was pressure on him. There were organizational measures because he tries to enter the room of his servants all the time. So they put a room in another part of the castle so he couldn't enter so easily. And uh, finally, there was a general cultural change. So everybody was behaving differently. So what do you think? Are there lessons for healthcare here? In a, more or less, I would say. The, the lesson is actually that also in healthcare, uh, every change you see a number of factors playing a role, and you need to work on all these different uh, uh, aspects. And when I go, I, I told you, I'm, I'm in this business for more than 30 years. And when we speak about change and quality improvement, I've seen many fashions come by. In the, begin in the 80s and the 90s, most of the time, and maybe people of my age can remember that, the emphasis was very strongly on local professional education, on clinical guidelines, on licensing, on clinical audit, etc. Then in the 90s, we saw this management movement coming. Disease management, total quality management, can you remember that? Care pathways, etc. And then in the 2000s, we can into a new situation. At the moment in the Netherlands, uh, uh, change is mostly driven at the moment by external control and accountability. So financial incentives, public reporting, transparency, you put your data on the website, uh, and patient choice. So the question is, is there any of these different approaches more successful or superior to anyone else? Now, we haven't never found evidence for that. I've just put one uh, reference there, a Lancet, Lancet pu publication, but you will see it over and over again. All these different approaches probably have to offer us something to us, but the world of change and improving, also in integrated services, is much more complex. And not to make it negative for you, but I, I would say just a way of thinking in a detailed way uh, about change in integrated service in the family uh, medicine. So you can read more about it. This is a small, short advertisement. You can read more in this book about it if you would like. And then this the main, main message. Failed or successful improvements in practice, in family medicine, in hospital care, in integrated service is usually influenced by a complex mix of positive and negative factors related to what type of change, what type of guidelines, the patient, the patient's working with you, individual professionals, routines, resistance, knowledge, skills, the social context, how the teams, how our peers working together, the collaboration between uh, professionals and disciplines, the organizational context, uh, money, staff, leadership, etc., and the wider political and econo 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 economical uh, context. So this is the world you need to work with. And what I, I'm going to do now, and you will see this during my lecture, is a range of projects, often uh, research projects from my old uh, institute or PhD students for myself, give you a range of examples just to bring the message across, and you will see many are about primary care or integrated services. I've tried to give you the evidence. And this is a project from the 1990s. And I, I present it to you because it was in primary care, and it was one of the most successful projects I ever done. So very educational project, and nevertheless it failed. And I explained to you why it failed in the end. So it's about introducing prevention of flu vaccination, uh, prevention of cervical cancer by smears, and uh, cardiac risk um, uh, reduction. Yeah, I think you're working on this as well. It was a national project. We developed for that actions at a national level, regional level, and practice level. 
We had educational programs. We had ICT support programs for the practice. We had a, a financial incentive for the practices if they did a, a vaccination or a smear or whatever. At the local level, we organized education for doctors and nurses. We had regional arrangement between, and we trained regional coaches, facilitators, outreach visitors to go to practices. So at the level of the practice, we had outreach visits, on average three, four visits to a practice where the visitors help the practices arrange everything, organize everything for this type of uh, uh, prevention. And it was enormously successful. Very, very, very quick change. Uh, you see, from 94 to 97, it's a, a big change. In 1997, we had 80 to 90 percent of the population of risk was uh, vaccinated. Pap smears, very quick changes. Blood pressure management, very uh, uh, quick changes. So the question is, why was this, this intervention so successful? And I've made a list for you. And listen well, because this message is coming across all the time. Yeah? First of all, it was a program that was well prepared. We did a randomized controlled trial first to study whether this was really working. Then we changed the program a little bit and piloted in one region, and then we did a national rollout. We had a limited number of evidence-based targets, and often in projects, they have far too many targets. So, restrict yourself to one, two, three, very, very concrete targets. There were interventions at different levels that were linked to each other, national, regional, local, practice level. It was a combination of bottom-up activities and top-down activities. There was this support by facilitators that were, had the expertise to help practices. The financial incentives were very important. And finally, the professional leadership. This was run by the professional organization with political support and money from the government. But after it was so successful, the project collapsed after a severe conflict, conflict between the government and the professional organization, not about this prevention program, but this was just about the payment of uh, general practitioners, family doctors. So they said, we stopped with the project, and the government was very angry. They didn't speak with us for years, uh, among the, uh, them for years. So it was really a severe conflict. So you can see all the different elements that you need for such a successful project. Okay, I go then, in my second example, I go a little bit more into the deep. Yeah? You will see the same elements coming back, but now I will focus on a good change pro proposal, how important that is. And this is about the use of antidepressants in, uh, in primary care. Maybe it's different for you in Cat Catalonia, I don't know. But in the Netherlands we have done studies that showed that, extensive, that there is extensive use of antidepressants. Is it in Spain the same? And the extensive use is not linked to actually uh, the problem to the symptom severity. So many patients who don't have severe problems get antidepressants and patients who need it don't get it. So we wanted to improve that. An improvement program, you see it here, with a variety of interventions. I hope you can read it. First of all, very important, an evidence-based protocol for step care. Do you have step care protocol in primary care here? Okay. But the key message here is for non-severe patients, and you use the back depression inventory, for non-severe patients, you don't start with antidepressants. You start with simple measures, exercise, counseling. After six weeks, when it's not improved, you start with antidepressants and or psychotherapy. And you continue with monitoring to see if there's progress. That, that's all. Yeah. So there was a plan, a program, with multidisciplinary teams from different practices coming together. Uh, support from an external team to help in the change process, uh, data collection on the pre uh, uh, depressants and feedback to the practice, how they were doing, and local coordinators. Did it work? Yes. There was a controlled study, 
And you see here, between 2006-2008, an intervention group with 400 patients, usual care, um, large, very large group, and you see an, an, a substantial reduction in the, in the intervention group from 49 to 26 percent, and in the usual care, it was even an increase. So the key message is a good study with such a program, you can indeed improve prescribing and more rational prescribing for, uh, on antidepressants. But the question is, what helped in, uh, in uh, this change? So there were interviews done with eight teams in the intervention group uh, to see, and they were asked, what helped you, and what were the barriers to change, and what helped you to change? And quite interesting uh, information. The most important thing they said, uh, what helped us, was this simple, evidence-based step care model. This fits into my daily work. That's the way patients come in. They're suited to my practice. Also, the multidisciplinary team me meetings that you hear with other, from others, and the positive reaction from patients. But the barriers were, on the other side, when conflicting views of, uh, between collaborating professionals. So if professionals didn't agree on the step care protocol, they say, okay, I, will, I don't want that. I want to work in a different way. So when they disagree about it. And the lack of resources and external support, because that was what they needed. So I, I come now to a list, and you don't need to recall this, but it's a long list, but speaking about the, the difficulty of change, my message is that most of the time you need to work on different aspects of care, of uh, change, in order to be successful. And here you see a, a list on issues you need to work, more or less. And that is, for instance, translating evidence or a guideline into a simple care pathway, a simple decision aid, a simple care bundle, yeah, that is fitted for practice. You need to work on people collaborating with each other. You need to work on standardization of processes. I come back to that. You need to involve the patients. You need to collect data and give feedback. You need to help practices because they can't do it on their own. You need to help practices from outside. Um, you need to train professionals because in quality improvement and changing their practice because that's all new and you need professional leadership. And in the rest of my lecture, and I hope I have enough time for that, uh, Rosa, yeah, uh, I go quickly through all these different things. Uh, just give you, you one or two examples and uh, then I come back with this list again. That's what I'm going to do. And maybe I take a little bit of water and Okay. First about fragmentation in chronic care. And you spoke already about integrated care, collaboration, coordination. To give you some evidence, there are many, many studies, and one of my uh, previous collaborators and, and very dear colleague, Michelle Lenzing, Rosa knows him very well because she's working with him uh, in an international project, he did a systematic review of systematic reviews. So hundreds and hundreds of studies. And actually, his conclusion was integrated and coordinated care for patients with heart failure, diabetes, depression, depression, etc., is related to better quality, better patient outcomes, and lower costs. This is what you see all the time. And I only underline this with one of my previous uh, PhD uh, students who did a randomized control trial control study in 44 practices on a care pathway, a very structured care pathway uh, in COPD care for elderly patients. And this was actually remodeling primary care because before it was just the COPD patients coming to the general petition and then to, uh, the general petition doing, of the family doctor doing everything. After that, the, uh, the family doctor delegating specific tasks to a practice nurse, education and counseling, and to an external support service. So all the administrative work around inviting and reminding patients of going to the lab, etc., 
that was done by an external uh, organization. Not seeing any patients, but very helpful because of the organizational aspect. And then a specific role for the lung specialist. Yeah? In case of specific outcomes of the, of the tests, the lung specialist was, giving, was seeing the information and giving advice to the young patient. A very well uh, defined care pathway. And this was really working, as you can see. Um, more control visits, more frequent, frequent lung function tests, more sp stop smoking advice, less smokers, less ex exacerbation. So it's an example of the way you restructure, collaborate, but particularly also the standardization of uh, the, the whole care process. And I'll come back to that again. And I would just point to the crucial role of the nurse. One of my PhD students did a Cochrane review on that. 18 reviews she has seen, summarized that, and said substitution of tasks to a nurse, from general practitioner to a nurse, specific task is, uh, uh, is effective. And patients like that because they get a little bit more time. It's not particularly more cheap, but it's uh, certainly effective. Okay. I also said involve the patient. And I could speak for two hours now on involving patients, which I like very much. But I give you just one example of that may fit into the Catalonian area as well. Uh, involving chronic patients as, partner, as partners in local health policies. One of my PhD students was from Canada, and he did a beautiful stu study in the northern part of Canada, in a remote area, in six health authorities. And three health authorities were used as, a, as a intervention areas, and the other were control areas. And what they did was, in the intervention areas, they trained the patients to be a real partner, a real discussion in uh, deciding on local health priorities. Um, so making uh, decisions on local priorities also linked to the healthcare budget. And what you see was different, more relevant priorities compared to regions where patients were not uh, involved in policy making. And also physicians and patients influenced each other deeply each other's opinions deeply, and this was not the case in the control areas where just doctors and uh, uh, local health authorities uh, were speaking about uh, the priorities. Very interesting project, I think very relevant for Netherlands and also for Spain. So I was just mentioning care pathways and this meditation, and I would like to refer to a very interesting book. It's more about uh, hospital care, but it also fits to primary care. Why is this so important? It's written by Atul Gawande, the checklist manifesto, particularly for hospitals and surgery. But I think it's a very nice message. And what he is saying is healthcare is too complex, and before it was not the case. You could do it on your own. But today, it's too complex to leave it to individual professionals. And why? Not because they are not so, good, uh, so well trained. They are actually much better trained than before professionals. Yeah, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Now, the reason is what human memory and attention needed all the time is fallible in complex care. There are so many things you need to take into account. You can't do it just all on your own. So, therefore, we should use teamwork, mutual control, professionals control each other, and checklists. And checklist help with that. And I have this metaphor of Odysseus and the sirens. You know the story probably that there was a beautiful, the sirens could sing beautifully, and Odysseus knew that. But the case was if you came too close with your ship to the shore to listen to the uh, music, you would run into the shore and then you would be, uh, your ship would be gone. Yeah? That's the story. And Odysseus, what he did was saying, okay, tie myself to the mast, and then he asked his crew to put their, to put their uh, wax, wax, uh, wax in their ears so that they couldn't hear the singing. And when they passed by, um, beautiful singing, and he said, okay, make me free, make me free, and the uh, crew couldn't hear him, and so they passed by, he heard the singing, but he was tied to the mast, so they survived. 
So the message in that is that sometimes professionals need to tie themselves to the mask because care is too complex. Understand the metaphor, I hope. I give you one example, and this is about hospital care, but I think it's not definitely in uh, primary care. It's, uh, you have this MRSR problem. We have it a little bit less, but we will get it. Um, reduction of antibiotic use is one of the top priorities, I would say, for the next decade. Because otherwise we will end in, uh, in enormous uh, epidemics. And this is a uh, system, Cochrane review, systematic review of studies of reducing antibiotic use in hospitals. In most studies, they found an, a significant effect of the interventions. But restrictive methods, where there was authorization by a colleague, or automatic stop order when you wanted to prescribe an antibiotic before you could do it, was much more effective than educational methods. So you were just tied to a mask before you could prescribe an antibiotic. Would it work in Spain? Think about it. Yeah. I have this PhD, had this PhD student also um, that show, has shown that an intensive collaboration between a family doctor and a pharmacist with a medication review and then where the, uh, the uh, pharmacist checked the uh, primary care doctor on prescribing in the frail elderly, over 75, more than four medications, was very successful only in case when they had communication about it. Then I would sp speak briefly about substitution of care, because that's the other issue of reducing the cost. I, you can re reduce uh, the cost and maybe improve the quality by uh, substitution of care from hospital to primary care. And you can do it in different ways. Transfer, GPs take over tasks of the medical specialist, relocation, specialists reach out and come into primary care and liaison the collaboration of GP specialists, um, for instance, by shared care. And there was a review, and that says, most promising is uh, the first one, transfer. GPs take over tasks, and particularly direct access of the do uh, family doctor to diagnostic services, the follow-up of specialist care by the family doctor, and special surgeries, for instance, chronic care in uh, general practice. And I give you one example. I, I don't know if it fits into the in your uh, situation, but this is about family doctor providing long-term follow-up in breast cancer. Is this the case in Catalonia? No? It is not the case in the Netherlands. You see in the Netherlands that uh, general practitioners have uh, specialist services in their practice. This is very difficult. Nevertheless, there was a very good multi-center randomized control on this. That patients after 9 to 15 months, they were treated, it was okay, and then there were, uh, the follow-up was given in the hands of uh, primary care. And the results, no significant uh, uh, difference in deaths or uh, uh, serious clinical events or quality of life between follow-up by the oncologist and follow-up by the primary care doctor. So it could be easily transferred to primary care. It is much cheaper and it works, it's close to the patient, etc. So then another study, also in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, on barriers to follow-up of cancer care by the general practitioner. And most important barriers were the lack of communication between GPs and oncologists. And the uncertainty, there's no clear protocol, no clear, clear pathway, no stepped care model um, available to do it. And lack of communication. Let me speak about that. Then I go to another issue, safe care. John Oker fight. Very nice report for the Health Foundation in 2011. He also speaks about, but he speaks about safety. And he says many unsafe situations are caused by incomplete coordination. Communication failures, lack of information in handovers, incomplete discharge letters, etc. So we need multidisciplinary teams, coordinated discharge planners, post-charge care, etc. And 
a, a really new passion is coming today from the United States, and this is about readmissions, readmissions to hospitals. And they say about two and a half million patients are readmitted to hospitals within 30 days in the United States. I think in Holland it's about 10%, not um, 20%. But the suggestion from, from the first studies is coordination, communication during the transition from hospital to primary care, a medication plan, a plan by what's the general practitioner doing, crucial importance. Yeah. And then this study, we, we did it ourselves, uh, a survey on coordination of care and handovers. It was not in Spain, but it was in Germany, Netherlands, United Kingdom, and Denmark. And read this, has your GP, it was in 4,500 chronic patients, so patients who have a chronic condition. Has your GP organized and coordinated care provided by others, for instance, hospital care or prevention? Or was your GP well informed by the care you received by other healthcare providers and services, specialists, after hours? You see the figures. For instance, in the Netherlands, we really could improve in coordination. And here, the United Kingdom, yeah, no collaboration. We often take the United Kingdom as an example for us, but no coordination between primary and hospital care. So how is this in your country, this collaboration? Anyway, there was also a European project on barriers to safe discharge and handover from hospital to primary care with many, many medical specialists, patients, nurses, family doctors in five European countries. And the most important problems were related to the hospitals. Hospitals are only involved with themselves, but also the attitude on both sides of the doctors not focused on collaboration. And hospital doctors and family doctors as rivals. And a professional identity oriented on own discipline. So this is one of the main challenges to organize something that teams of specialists and primary care doctors are sitting together. And some, sorry, uh, I go back. Uh, someone called uh, Judy hofer Gittel wrote a beautiful book and she speaks about relational coordination. We need to train people in frequent, high quality communication, supported by shared goals, shared knowledge and mutual respect. That's what we need to train. That's one of the challenges we need to do. Um, and that demands new professional leadership. When I was in the uh, United States, uh, I think two years ago or so, uh, one year ago, in the morning I found USA Today on my, uh, on my room. Uh, and there was an article by the uh, chair of the Amer American Board of Internal Medicine. And he wrote about the fact that they stopped Dr. House. You have Dr. House in Spain? And he said, okay, actually that's a very good thing that we stopped because we need physicians who are smart, well-trained, innovative, intensely focused on delivering the best care, but also who can play well with others. While House had many of the skills, the teamwork part was his fatal flaw. And if he worked for me, I would have fired him. So this brings us to invest in professional leadership, a new type of leadership. And uh, how am, am I doing with the time, uh, Rosa? Five minutes? It's probably okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's, let's just discuss this a little bit. And there are, again, you are change agents. You see, you're here coming to this conference. You want to learn. You would like to improve healthcare. And you see around that there is also a lot of resistance in your colleagues. So leadership is needed to overcome that. And yeah, I've just made a list from my own experience. Why is it so difficult to get professionals involved or your colleagues involved? Often because they don't have insight in their own performance. They don't know how good or bad they are doing. Or they have their fixed routines and they feel pressured. Or they are, have real fear for innovation because they have the feeling that they work in a stable environment. They don't want to have any change in that. Or, sorry, they, they have a lack of knowledge. So how are you doing this, this quality improvement? Or they are not trained to collaborate with their colleagues. Or they don't want any outside uh, interference. 
or resistance to admitting admit mistakes because they are trained like that but never to admit any mistakes or that you can improve at all. Yeah. These type of problems you need to overcome. And I ha don't have an answer to all these things. Just a few important things. First of all, my absolute conviction is that every type of change starts with data. You need information on actual quality in order to convince people that improvement is possible. And the reality is there's much unrealistic op uh, optimism. Most clinicians overrate what they are doing. And this is evidence based, very good paper. Reliable data and feedback give insight and cre increase the sense of urgency. And you can really improve the feedback to providers can contribute to better quality when it comes from a reliable source, preferable data they have collected themselves, is recent, give advice how to do better, and is repeated regularly regularly and integrated in a wider system of quality improvement. With, for instance, local activities, group work, team and multidisciplinary collaboration, when you integrate it in that, it can work. That's one thing. And I, I skipped this one. The second is, I already mentioned that, the help you give to practices in order to do better. Most practices find it too difficult to do it on their own. And we have many, many examples of trained persons, effectivity of trained persons, could be an expert, a colleague, a nurse, comes to a team or a practice for data, feedback, for education, for integration, introduction of best practice in integrated services, social services, um, supporting co coaching on, for instance, record system, teaching them improvement methods, helping to change the team culture, this type of work and proved to be effective in many studies. And I just got a very new study in addiction. Coaching is the activity with Dave Gustafsson. Last study, 200 teams, addiction teams or so. Coaching is the active, active ingredient of change in addiction uh, practices. So that's the second. The third is you need to train professionals in how to do this business of data collection, looking at data, local peer review, uh, quality improvement, starting quality improvement in your own practices. Because it's concerned with new knowledge, skills, routines, improvement knowledge. And it's naive to expect that professionals can master this on their own. And you can do this by, for instance, leaders who got a training first and then train their colleagues after being trained. Yeah. And the last, I come to leadership. And you can imagine that if FC Barcelona had to train on such a field, they wouldn't be the world champion, probably, isn't it? And uh, so you need to create a beautiful, um, um, a very facilitating context for all these different activities that I said, for professionals. Let me... Um, maybe you have ever read about the new contract. I think this is also a very interesting example. Uh, the, the new contract for primary care in the United Kingdom it was in 2004, where they related about 25 to 30 percent of the income to achieving targets, particularly in chronic care and integrated services diabetes, cardiovascular, lung diseases, etc. And what you saw was that uh, the impact, very high indicator scores. And, and most practices meeting quality criteria already after one year. So they got a substantial increase in income. So the question was, was the financial incentive, was that the driver for change, or was there something else? And I would ask, oh, maybe government policies, clinical leadership. So look at this one. What you see here, you see this is 1998, 2003, this is 2005, 2007. The, chain, the new contract was here. So you see an evaluation here, asthma, diabetes, coronary heart disease. There was already change before. And then it was, so there was already a change pr process going for a long time. And this change process was going because of national policies by the government and by uh, the 
professional organizations. That's my interpretation. So I come to almost my last slide. Invest in leadership. Leaders who create the context for change, for data collection and feedback, for coordination and collaboration between disciplines, for standardization and control, for involvement of professionals, for involvement of patients. They should make quality improvements, integrated care, safe care, all these different things, to a top priority. They should be a role model. So actually I'm speaking about you. You should introduce long-term policies on improvement, facilitate improvement projects, and also for that, there's evidence. And different studies show when leaders are making quality into a top priority, are actively involved, and others see it, then there's more activity. So, this was my list. And I took you briefly through all these different aspects. Yeah, read it again. Translating evidence or guidelines into very, very simple models, care pathways, a uh, limited number of targets. Organize multidisciplinary collaboration. Standardize processes with checklists, yeah, very well defined. Involve patients in this, these processes. Particularly collect data on what you're achieving. Give support to practices by people coming from outside and helping practices for a while. And train professionals in all these new methodologies, new ideas. It's so complex, you need to invest in it. So you can imagine this is long term policy making. Yeah? You can't do this in one year or two years. This is five, ten year policy making in local areas in uh, Catalonia. So, looking back, for me, 35 years, evidence, experience, and uh, you see my changes. Yeah? I'm an old man now, gray, and uh, I behave like an old man. And, but I've seen many hypes coming by. I've also seen hope. I had hope myself and optimism. And I think I myself have got a better understanding. I think in general we have a better understanding of change processes. We have seen examples of success. We particularly also have seen many new challenges coming for you, yeah, because the world has changed. We don't speak about individual patients anymore. We speak about large groups of um, chronic patients, frail elderly, um, coming to us. And uh, we need to change the services for these patients. We need to collaborate between hospitals, primary care, social services. Enormous challenges. So I'm absolutely convinced that you will do a very good job, and I wish you a lot of success with this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard, for this, I would say, very relevant lecture. I'm sure that it's very good that you have accepted that we have that in the website. I would recommend most of you to come back to these slides and think how they fit in your, your real practice. But I think this is a lesson that we will probably use for years. So thank you very much, Richard. Uh, he will be available during the coffee time if you wanted to approach him and discuss it. I think it's very difficult to make questions on some such a, I would say, global uh, approach to change. Percent of people are among us. Y estaba donando las gracias a las. Creo que la traducción debía estar traduciendo seguramente, sí. Le estaba donando las gracias al profesor Rol para que esta hizo magistral. Que creo que será muy útil, de verdad, al ser recomano, tanto si son de la atención primaria como si los servicios sociales, como si de otros ámbitos como los hospitales o los servicios sociales de base o la planificación, porque las son sobre las estrategias de cambio, el valor de que esta diapositiva de las recomendaciones sobre las estrategias de cambio, en tengo tu caso de comprobar que funcionan a todos los ámbitos. Y funcionan en proyectos de salud social de base, funcionan en proyectos de integración asistencial, funcionan en proyectos de atención más compleja. 
Per tant, jo us recomanaria que realment repasséssim aquesta lliçó, que és una gran oportunitat d'haver-la tingut. El professor Grol estarà per aquí durant el cafè amb nosaltres, si algú vol fer-li algun comentari. Donar-los les gràcies i passaríem a la següent part del nostre dia d'avui, que és el cafè. Moltes gràcies.